Well, shalom all. My name is Todd Bennett, and today I am reading the Shema Yisrael newsletter uh, from day 11 of month 11 on the Creator's calendar, also known as January 15th, 2022, on the Roman calendar. Now, we're four months out from the appointed times of month 7, when all Yisrael would rejoice during the Feast of Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Ingathering. Now, I know there's many new people to this newsletter. If you're not familiar with the appointed times, I would recommend that you uh, uh, review Leviticus 23 just to give you a summary of the appointed times. They're essentially celebrations, feasts, special days that uh, the Creator has provided for us all to uh, observe and are there as kind of an outline and a blueprint for his plan to restore the planet and mankind. Some people just think they're Jewish holidays, but they are not. The scriptures say they belong to him. So if you're not familiar with the appointed times, I recommend that you uh, review that. Leviticus 23, and I also have written a book entitled Appointed Times, and it's available on the ShemaiIsrael.net website. So we've passed the feast of the seventh month, and obviously I indicated we're in we're in month eleven, and uh, we're going to be winding down the year here and approaching uh, a new year. But as we look back at Sukkot, the feast of tabernacles, the feast of ingathering, different names for it, and as we assess the past fruit harvest, we also look forward with anticipation to the renewed grain harvests that are the focus of Passover unleavened bread and Shavuot uh, and uh, of course uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread occur in the first month and then Shavuot which is also known as Pentecost occurs 50 days after uh, day 16 of month 1 the day after uh, the high the first high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread so we passed uh, the end of the cycle, and we're looking for a renewal of another cycle. And while we're not presently in the land participating in these harvests, we understand that they were built into the lives of the covenant people with purpose and meaning. The covenant people were supposed to be intimately connected with the covenant land. In fact, Isaiah likens a future restoration of the people in the land to a marriage. It says, you no longer be termed forsaken, uh, you shall, uh, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hepzibah, and your land Beulah, for Yah delights in you, and your land shall be married. And that's in Isaiah 62, 4. In fact, uh, Adam, who's the man, the first man, uh, was taken from ha adama, which is the Hebrew word for ground. And you can clearly see the connection between the two in the Hebrew text. Man and the earth shared an intimate relationship that was disrupted after the fall. Now, we know that the life of a Hebrew flows in cycles, and we're supposed to be in sync with the harvest cycles, in sync with the land, because the land is where our, our food comes from. So it's a it's this uh, cyclic relationship between man and the food. And as we rehearse the appointed times, uh, we learn about the restoration between people and the land with each other and with Yah. These seasons, as they're sometimes referred to uh, in Genesis 1, it, it says that this, the, the two great lights are for uh, seasons. Well, it's actually Moedim in Hebrew, and it refers to the appointed times the seasons of life that we experience with crops uh, have even deeper significance in our individual lives. I hope that you all experienced a marvelous harvest last Sukkot and bore much fruit. And of course, that's why uh, it's a feast, because we're supposed to be feasting and rejoicing at the fruit of the harvest. Uh, if we approach the grain harvest, the question is whether you will experience an abundance in the future at a future feast. Of course, the point of it all is that these things don't just take place by chance. It takes planning, preparation, and effort. The farmer doesn't just wait and hope 
that barley uh, magically appears in the spring uh, without ever planting any seed. He doesn't just believe in his heart that Yah will bless him with a bountiful crop. Likewise, you should not expect to bear fruit in your life if you haven't prepared for the harvest. Uh, sometimes when I brought tour groups to Israel, I would take them to uh, a, an archaeological site uh, referred to as Tel Gezer, and a tell is just basically a mound uh, where it's an unnatural mound where you can tell it's not just a hill, but there was a civilization under there, and over time it's built up, and so when you look, you see it's 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 like a hill, but uh, not a natural flowing hill, and, and sometimes it even has a flat top. So you can tell that it's just, it's not right. And as you start digging, you get down to houses and buildings and structures. And, and uh, of course, th this was originally just a hill, but then they realized it was the ancient site of Gezer. Now, the remains of this site are interesting due to its geographical location and prominence on trade routes. And uh, it's in the land apportioned to Ephraim, although Ephraim never removed all the Canaanites, according to Judges 129. Of course, that was part of the problem. Uh, they were commanded to take the land and, and remove all of its inhabitants, and they didn't do that. And, of course, we know Ephraim was the head of uh, Joseph and the head of the ten northern tribes, eventually, that consisted of the house of Israel. And so... Because they never completely separated from the Canaanites and mixed with them, they ended up, ultimately, we know that they built two golden calves under uh, Jeroboam. And uh, that's why they were removed from the land. And a, a couple months ago, I wrote an uh, article, uh, Time's Up, you know, what's next? Uh, and essentially the uh, time of punishment for Ephraim and the house of Israel is over. So we're expecting uh, great things to occur uh, regarding restoration of the house of Israel and the house of uh, Judah. And as the prophets have promised, uh, uh, they prophesied, and uh, the promises that Yah gave to his prophets. And uh, many of the things that we actually are seeing going on in the world today are about that restoration. And sadly, most of the world doesn't even realize that all of these prophetic events are taking place right now. So, uh, uh, Gezer is one of the cities that Solomon is credited with fortifying, and it shares the trademark uh, triple-level Solomonic gates uh, with Hatzor and Megiddo. And, of course, I take groups to these places, and, you know, you can see that they have the same gates at these locations, and so they've been attributed to Solomon and the... Uh, the um, uh, construction that he did is recorded in 1 Kings 9, 15 through 17. Now, those efforts of Solomon demonstrate the point of keeping a watch and maintaining a hedge, as we discussed in the message from last week. In this case, the hedge involved walls and gates of stone. He fortified strategic uh, cities that were integral to the defense of the land. They were likened to the migdals uh, that Yah places in his vineyard. Remember last in the last message, we talked about the Migdals, where the the strong towers or the watchtowers. So these strong fortified cities were like the watchtowers, and and they allowed the Israelites to keep watch over the land and protect the land from these strategic places, uh, usually on trade routes and such, so they could see who was coming in and if a, a major army was approaching through one of these. Uh, uh, road systems, then they could uh, be right there uh, to defend the land. Now, aside from the remnants, remnants of this fortress city, there's an interesting artifact that was found at this site known as the Geezer Calendar. And we can see right from the picture that it's inscribed in Paleo-Hebrew. And uh, that is, uh, it's an incredible find because we don't get too much uh, of the Paleo-Hebrew artifacts to, to examine. And this is an ancient limestone tablet, and we can read how the people of the land viewed the harvest cycle. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is many times you just find a, a shard of a pottery or something very uh, small, a fragment of a message or a fragment of a name or something. And this is, this is a whole rendition 
and it's called the uh, geezer calendar although it's more likely uh, a, just a, uh, a schedule you know or a time schedule so written in paleo hebrew script the tablet reads as follows two months gathering two months planting two months late sowing one month cutting flax one month reaping barley one month reaping and measuring grain two months pruning one month summer fruit <clears throat> now we don't know exactly who wrote this or why but it gives an outline of how a year would be viewed by a person whose life revolved around the harvest cycle and how different this is from someone <clears throat> immersed in you know modern society we don't even think about that we just go to the grocery store and, and buy whatever's on the shelf and usually it doesn't even matter what the harvest season is uh, you just buy whatever you want all year round. You buy fruit all year round. You're not waiting for the fruit harvest uh, to finally enjoy those, you know, wonderful figs and pomegranates and things like that that you haven't had all year long. Um, we just can go and get figs and pomegranates anytime we want, usually. So it's uh, it gives you a, a, a different... Uh, outlook on life when you're waiting for the harvest and you're anticipating the harvest. Now flax, barley, and wheat are all reaped from the fields. Uh, they need to be planted by sowing seeds every year and then later reaped and processed. And that takes a lot of work and is a direct result of man's expulsion from the garden. And remember that it was only when man was expelled from the garden that he was told because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread uh, till you return to the ground, Adamah, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now prior to that time, man was placed in a garden planted by Elohim. And we talked last week about the fact that the Hebrew word is gan, and it means a protected space. So the garden was a protected space, and we know that Yah planted the trees that bore fruit. He did all the work that would yield food for the man and the woman. All man had to do was tend tend it, which is, uh, means to serve, and watch over it, uh, which means to guard. And we're actually supposed to be like those, and, you know, the woman and the man were planted in the garden with the trees, and we're supposed to be like those trees planted in the garden, according to Psalm 1. It said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yah, and in his Torah he, mediates, he, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Uh, the man was entrusted with the garden, uh, but something happened. The hedge was breached. The man and the woman were tested by the Nakash, which is often translated serpent, but really means the shining one. It was this Nakash was a a you know a powerful spiritual entity, and uh, he deceived them, and they chose to believe a lie, and they disobeyed the commandment. And as a result of their disobedience, they were evicted from paradise and placed outside that. A protective hedge and that's when the real work began because again we read the, the ground was cursed because of their actions and there also shows you the connection again between the man and the the adama the ground since that time men have been toiling and sweating for their bread uh, it wasn't just about going and picking fruit from a tree anymore and Israel was shown that Yah would give them bread from heaven in the form of manna. So in a sense, we're seeing that uh, he would just provide food again. Uh, they didn't have to toil for grain in the wilderness. And that's an important lesson for those intent on Babylon.
on leaving Babylon because, yeah, he wants to feed us, but uh, as long as we're under this curse, as long as mankind is under this curse, um, they have to toil and sweat for food, but Yah's intention is to to deliver man from that curse and once again provide food for man. Until that time, we continue to toil and sweat and uh, the barley and the wheat were sown in months 9 and 10. So the harvest cycle uh, never really ends. So we came out of Sukkot in month 7. That was the Feast of Ingathering. That was the fruits, the fruit harvest. And that continued uh, on even after Sukkot. Um, and so as they continued to harvest the, the fruits, then they, they changed their attention to the upcoming grain harvest. And they know that we've got a plant in month nine and month ten if we expect to get a barley harvest in in month one so while we can briefly pause and reflect during the feast the work continues and uh, that's what's important the important point that i'm, I'm showing with the geezer calendar the geezer tablet right now we're in the period referred to as late sowing or late planting. Late planting included supplemental crops such as garlic, uh, cucumbers, melons, lentils, chickpeas, sesame, millet, and, and other vegetables. And they're the extra crops. They're, they're not vital for existence, but they definitely add some spice to an otherwise bland diet. And interestingly, they are the things that Israelites longed for after they left Egypt. And they, they said, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlics, the garlic. The Israelites had their bread from heaven, but they wanted the extras uh, that they were accustomed to in Egypt. Uh, there is no late planting in the wilderness, just manna. Uh, the manna was sufficient for their needs, and it even tasted good, but a constant reminder that they had not reached home yet. They had not gotten to the promised land. Uh, manna was not the permanent diet of a covenant people, and this is an important reminder for us all. Uh, when we're in the wilderness, we subsist, but the point is not just to remain there and survive. We need to keep following the leading of Yah until we reach the Jordan and cross over because we know he's got something better for us there. Now, there are many among us who long to remain in Egypt, and it's important to remember that although the Israelites were essentially slaves in Egypt, they owned homes, they they owned livestock, they had possessions, and we we understand that from the plagues when the plagues did not touch the livestock of of the Israelites, but but the, those of the Egyptians. So obviously the Israelites had livestock, they had things, and we know from excavations that there were Israelite settlements, and and they had houses, and so even though they were slaves, they were very similar. Uh, to us now, they, they had a life in Egypt, just as we have a life in Babylon. And uh, I've pointed out through the years that, you know, we are essentially slaves, and most people don't even realize it because they're deluded into thinking that they live in a free country and and they have their houses and their cars and their all their stuff that they've loaded in their houses. But you try, you know, not paying your taxes or you try not paying your property taxes and see how long you own your house. Or you try, you know, not paying your, your income taxes and see how long you have your job or your withholding tax or, or, or anything. You try to go buy gas without paying your tax. It's, it's uh, built into your, your, uh, your tax prices or even uh, the sales tax. You know, you try to go to a store and actually pay the price that's on uh, the, 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 the ticket there without including the tax. They, they won't sell it to you. So in other words, you've got these taxes and, and you've got controls and all sorts of things built in. So we are essentially are in a slave system, but we don't even recognize it. We're so used to it. So, so they had a life in Egypt, just as we have a life in Babylon. And the, the question is whether uh, you will cling to the life that you have here, or will you let it go and follow Yah as he leads us through the wilderness to the place that he promised and many are simply comfortable they would rather keep it the way it is they'd rather remain as slaves uh, because they're comfortable slaves they don't want to suffer any inconvenience and 
they don't want to move into the wilderness. They want to make uh, long-term plans and settle down. And did you know that the Israelites moved camp 42 times on their journey out of Egypt and into the Promised Land? Uh, that's a lot of moving, and uh, I often wonder if some people got tired of moving. You know, maybe they made their way out to the fringes of the camp, you know, and maybe every time they, they got to a new place, they just settled on the outskirts, and <clears throat> maybe ultimately they decided just to stay where they're at, you know, be, uh, when they found someplace more appealing. Uh, you know, okay, you guys go on, we're going to, we're going to stay here. We kind of found a shady spot here and, and we're okay. We're just exhausted. We don't want to do this moving anymore. You know, no one knows for sure, but you know, you have to wonder if this uh, whole process sifted some people out and they just decided they, they didn't want to keep following you anymore. Of course, then that's what happens in, in a lot of people's walks with him. You know, we have this daily walk and, and as he leads us through this life, this journey, you know, some people get excited when, you know, they run to an altar call or raise their hand at a evangelical outreach. And, you know, it's great at first. And, but, you know, the daily process of walking it out, sometimes they just get tired of it and they just decide to fall by the wayside. <clears throat> so, uh, the important thing to remember is that the wilderness is not our final destination. It's on the way to our destination. And the point of the wilderness is to learn to rely completely on Yah and focus on Him. And the lesson of the Gezer calendar is that people had to plan ahead, but not too far ahead. And as Hebrews, we need to focus on the cycles of, of the harvest. And of course, I, I call us Hebrews because we are following the pattern of Abraham. Abraham was called a Hebrew because he ultimately he uh, descended from Eber. Uh, the, that's the, the source of the name for Hebrew, but generally means someone that, who's crossed over. Abraham came from Babylon. He had to cross over the Euphrates. And he had to cross over the Jordan to come into the land. So, you know, he is marked by these crossings. And of course, Israel, when they, they left Egypt, they, they crossed the Red Sea and then they crossed over, uh, then they crossed over the Jordan when they came in. So our final crossing is the Jordan, but we got to cross over uh, eventually to come out of Egypt or to come out of, of Babylon. And that is the whole symbolism of baptism when we repent we turn to Yah, and then we're immersed it's it's symbolic of that crossing over and then and we all still need to cross over the jordan under the <clears throat> leadership of joshua which of course is the name of our messiah yeshua in hebrew so we're waiting for that final regathering and crossing over of the jordan under under his leadership and of course all of these are patterns in the the scriptures that are meant for a future people they're meant for us and that's why it's important that we you know we learn and understand these things and we remain in these cycles and we look forward to them and that's why again that's why i'm emphasizing the geezer calendar or the geezer schedule because we need to be always focused on on the harvests and then the plan of elohim and, and what's coming up and be ready for those things uh, and of course, those cycles naturally lead us into the kingdom. As we continue to uh, rehearse these cycles, the appointed times, that's the goal, is to keep us focused and, and rehearsing and ready uh, for his plan so that we uh, are, are uh, available and we're not taken by surprise like those ten virgins that I often uh, talk about in my uh teachings, and I'm going to emphasize that parable even further, uh, I think, uh, in the next couple of weeks, as we consider the fact that there were ten virgins who wanted to go to the wedding, but only five were considered wise and made it, and the other five were told, I do not know you, and so they showed up late, and uh, were told, I do not know you, they, they missed the feast, and of course, that's why timing is so critical in understanding and looking ahead. Now, we live in a society where people are obsessed with planning and preparing for retirement. Yeah. So they're looking, you know, 
20, 30, 40 years into the future. And uh, they start out their lives uh, with an education and they might go to for four years and then they might go another two or three to get uh, more and more degrees. And, and then they want to, you know, get hired by somebody to uh, find a career path uh, that will then dominate the rest of their lives. Uh, they'll just work and work and work the rest of their lives until eventually they can make enough money to ultimately retire and then finally enjoy life. So uh, it's this is the cycle that most people are fed. This is the normal life that mo most people are told they need to endeavor upon. And of course, this is a slave mentality that traps so many in people into existing in a consumer-driven society rather than living in the kingdom of Elohim. And of course, that's a whole other subject for a different story, but it's very, really regrettable because Yeshua specifically advised us to pray for our daily bread and specifically told us not to worry about tomorrow. And sadly, that's what most people are caught up with every day of their lives. They worry about so many details that they forget they were created to bear fruit, fruit for the kingdom. And there are so many uh, things that hinder us from bearing fruit, our jobs, our properties, our homes, our relationships, you name it. Most people are so busy that they never take the time to stop and examine their lives and inspect their fruit. And this is a part of the watching that we discussed last week as we inspect our hedges. We talked about that we we're supposed to have this hedge of protection around us. And Yah builds this hedge, and yet we can do things to uh, tear it down or create gaps or holes or things of that sort. And we have a watchtower. We're supposed to have a watchtower in the midst of the hedge so we can climb up there to watch and examine our hedge and, and make sure it's strong and, and uh, protective. And the point of it all is so that we can bear fruit. And that's what it all comes down to. And this is the underlying purpose of the rehearsals that Yah gives us through the appointed times. He specifically keeps his times in sync with the harvest so that we can learn from these parallels and be reminded of our purpose. In fact, it was no mistake that his house, the temple in Jerusalem, was built on a threshing floor. When Israel would go there to present their offerings, they were really were presenting themselves as offerings. So if you want to make the most out of the rehearsals of the appointed times, the first you must first determine whether you are bearing any fruit at all. When you present yourself, are you presenting an offering that is pleasing to him? And I often quote Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three because it had such a profound impact upon my life. And the context of that passage is all about bearing fruit. So let's take a moment to examine the larger portion of Matthew 7, beginning at 13. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. <clears throat> and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. <clears throat> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever bear, hears these things, these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended from the floods, and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended 
the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now notice we the different. It starts out with, uh, bear, you know, trees, one bearing good fruit, one bearing bad fruit, and we end up with foolish, you know, one foolish, one wise, and you see this connection between uh, good fruit and wisdom, a wise person, bad fruit, and a foolish person, and of course that's going to lead into our next message on the uh, wise and foolish virgins. <clears throat> of course, the critical part of this passage is the fact that Yeshua rejects people who think they're bearing fruit. Uh, and he starts off by saying, "You're going to cast, you know, the, the 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 trees bearing bad fruit. They get cast in the fire." And then he goes on to say he's going to reject people who think they're bearing fruit. In fact, most Christians would consider casting out demons, prophesying, and performing wonders as good fruit. Not so, according to Yeshua. Despite their actions, they were described as ones who practice lawlessness. These would be the foolish ones, uh, the ones, the trees bearing bad fruit. The Greek lawlessness is anomia, and it means uh, without the Torah, or better yet, w without the law, or without the Torah. So, since they were without the Torah, they were not bearing good fruit, and so here we are with trees bearing good fruit and the Torah and the, the ones the ones bearing bad fruit are without the Torah. And remember the tree planted by the water in Psalm 1? The tree was being nourished by the Torah, which provides life that resulted in good fruit. So this is all very uh, simple and straightforward, and yet we have been so distracted from these basic principles and concepts in the scriptures that many people are running around living lawless night lives thinking that they are saved and and they're going to heaven because they asked jesus into their life and and they have no interest though in in bearing good fruit and good fruit is what it all comes down to it's the mark of wisdom and sadly uh, you know, this all flies in the face of many people's understanding because they've been taught wrong. They have been, been influenced by the Nachash, the deceiver, uh, straight back from the garden, and his false prophets who lead people away from the tree of life, which is the Torah. Now, notice the reference to thistles and thorn bushes. and These are the items that would you'd make up the hedge of a garden as you removed them from within and cast them to the edges, you would actually be enhancing your hedge. And it's kind of ironic um, that we have these, these things uh, straight back from the garden, but it's a direct link to the punishment rendered upon Adam. If it were not from his punishment, if, if it were not from his punishment, uh, a result of that punishment, then we wouldn't have uh thistles and we wouldn't have thorns and all that so um you know we have this whole thing that uh you know go comes full circle from the curse that occurred in the garden now in the scriptures we see israel and yehuda uh, likened to grapes figs and, and olive trees and those represent good fruit and israel was supposed to bear good fruit uh, they were known by their fruits and when they were following Yah, they would produce good fruit. When they were disobedient, they would produce bad fruit. And we all bear fruit of some kind, and our identity and destiny is linked to those fruits. Not our birth certificates, our passports, or citizenship cards. Uh, he defines what is good fruit and what is bad fruit, and he will know us by our fruits. And so calling Jesus Lord and asking him into your heart will not get you into the kingdom. And guess what? Casting out demons, performing miracles, and prophesying are not the fruits that the Messiah is looking for if they are expressed by lawless individuals without the Torah. Rather, the ones who get into the kingdom are the ones doing the will of the Father. The will of the Father is expressed through his Torah. His instructions in Psalm 48, it says, I delight to do your will, O my El, and your Torah is within my heart. And Yeshua specifically stated, Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Uh, by this my Father is esteemed that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. He elaborated on the fruits that he desires to see when he proclaimed, For a tree is known by its fruit, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And the text in Hebrews provides further guidance on the fruits we should be presenting when it says, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to Elohim, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Uh, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices Elohim is well pleased. So, what you say reveals your heart, and what we do is the outward expression of your heart. Bearing good fruit is a demonstration of your obedience, and it reveals that your heart has been circumcised. And so those who bear uh, uh, fruit will be pruned, and that the purpose of the pruning is so that they will bear more fruit. And bearing fruit brings esteem to the Father and demonstrates that we are disciples of Yeshua. According to Yeshua, bearing fruit boils down to love, ultimately. That's why Yeshua uh, distilled the Torah into two great commandments. And we read in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, he says, You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Of course, we know it as the Shema. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. So, love is at the heart of the Torah. And we express our love through our obedience uh, Yeshua unequivocally stated, If you love me, keep my commandments. So love is not just some warm, fuzzy feeling, I love God, you know, and, and I love Jesus and all that. No, no, it's not just a feeling, it's your actions. And your actions, if you truly love him, you will do what he tells you to do. Our words and our obedience are our fruit. It's really that simple. And bearing good fruit involves effort and planning. It cannot just be left to chance. Therefore, it's important to consider the harvest cycle like the inhabitants of Gezer and, and the land. We're in the time of late sowing, so if you have neglected the planting, you'd better get going before it's too late. And if you're just getting started, consider the words of Peter. He provides the seeds that result in good fruit. He says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your belief a brightness to a brightness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, reverence, to reverence, brotherly affection, and to brotherly affection, love. Of course, we always end up at love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of your master, Yeshua, the Messiah. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten it, that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Master and Savior, Yeshua Messiah. So bearing good fruit is critical to entering the kingdom, and it requires diligence, according to Peter, in future messages, I'm going to delve further into the importance of bearing fruit relative to the marriage that we read about in Isaiah, as well as the marriage to Messiah 
in order to gain entrance to his kingdom, as we, we've discussed with the five uh, foolish and five wise virgins. For now, I suggest that we all check our calendar, make sure we're operating within the rhythm of the appointed times and the harvest of the kingdom. That's how we overcome and understand the future events described in the text of Revelation. And we see uh, the, the, the ultimate harvest being described in Revelation 14. Speaking of calendars, mark your calendar for next Shabbat when all who call upon the name of Yah throughout the world have an opportunity to plant seed and bear fruit through their, the, the sacrifices of their lips, uh, through praising the name of Yah. Uh, there's a United in Yah 12-hour praise and worship event scheduled for January 22nd, 2022. It's beginning at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I will have the honor of opening and closing uh, with prayer. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful time, wonderful opportunity. And I'll also be singing along with the musicians. But, of course, anybody that's heard me sing will know that I will have my microphone on mute so that no one will actually hear me other than the father <laughs> but uh anyways there's uh, some wonderfully talented uh brethren that are going to be sharing and i encourage you to to tune in for that it's always a great event make sure you don't miss it it's really a great opportunity to corporately praise yah and it's done in a very unique and incredible way so uh, hopefully we will uh, see you all as we tune in next week and I probably won't have a message next week as I'll be involved in the uh, United in Yah event but uh, we'll see about that but in any event we'll, we should have one the following Shabbat so for now uh, Shabbat Shalom my name is Todd Bennett from ShamaIsrael.net and uh, we will see you soon <laughs>